President Xi Jinping's extraordinary book, The Governance of China, does three things. It presents Xi's political philosophy, symbolizes Xi's rapid emergence as a strong leader, and communicates Xi's way of thinking to the world. Books normally tell stories from beginning to end, not this book. This book is a work in process offering Xi's thinking from when he became General Secretary of the Party in November 2012 to around mid-2014, well less than two years into his expected 10-year term of leadership. And here's what's especially interesting. Since his book was published in October 2014, Xi has put forth a new political theory. It's called the Four Comprehensives, and it highlights what she believes are the four most important elements for China's continuing development. How do the four comprehensives express Xi's policies? How do they work together? How do they align with the contents of Xi's book, The Governance of China? Let's analyze Xi's four comprehensives to get closer to China. The first comprehensive comes in the first chapter of the book complete the building of a moderately prosperous society. The idea was first proposed in 1979 by Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping. At that time, the country was recovering from the political chaos of the Cultural Revolution. China was poor, and ordinary people had few material goods. Now, after more than three decades of rapid economic growth, China has become the second largest economy in the world. Within a month of becoming China's leader, Xi Jinping visited the exhibition The Road to Rejuvenation and offered his vision of a Chinese dream. But the road to rejuvenation is not easy. Still too many Chinese people are living in poverty, and the wealth gap between the rich and poor is growing. China is facing a new series of complex challenges. Xi prescribed his therapy. We continue Rule of law goes hand in hand with deepening reform. One characteristic of a mature market economy is a robust legal system. China is working hard to meet that criterion. The government abolished the re-education through labor system. Miscarriages of justice and prior legal cases are being corrected. She stressed the need for rule of law in a number of meetings. One problem in implementing the rule of law, as well as in creating a fair and equitable society, has been corrupt officials at high levels. In the first two years since she took office, more than 70 corrupt officials at or above ministerial level have been punished. She's phrase, power must be caged by the system and catching tigers as well as flies. Senior officials as well as junior ones guilty of corruption have become public catchphrases. The public has welcomed the crackdown on corruption. China continues to explore and experiment as it continues to develop. The four comprehensives could serve as a blueprint for years to come. Mr. Sun Ye Li, deputy director of the party literature office of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, spoke about the significance of the four comprehensives. When I look at the four comprehensives in each one of the elements, I see a different character to the nature of each one. So let's go through them. The first is a moderately well-off society. Well, that's a goal. That's something we aspire to. Second, deepening reform. That's a means. That's the way we get to the goal. Third, rule of law. That's a principle. That's the way things should be, very, very formal principle. And fourth, the strict discipline of the party is, a, is like a state of action. It's an enforcement. So each of the four have a different character to them. H how does that help us understand the unity? Uh, 
，全面建成小康社会是目标，就是我们要达到的这个我们要努力的方向。那么全面深化改革就是动力。这个呃，你像这个全面依法治国，那么它实际上是我们一个呃非常重要的依托。那么全面成员制党，它是关键或者保证。这里面可以打一个比喻，比如说我们整个的中国的发展像一列高速的列车，那么全面小康就是我们要到达的下一个重要的站点。那么全面深化改革，它就是这个列车的动力系统。哎，要这列车要有动力。那么全面依法治国啊。应该说是轨道，我们要沿着这个轨道走，没有轨道，你动力再强就翻车了。一定要沿着一定的轨道，全面从严治党，就是把党建设成为我们中国特色社会主义的这个领导核心或者主心骨啊。它就相当于这列火车的，呃，操控室，或者说是，呃，司机吧，他在掌握这个方向。我理解啊，简单的理解是这么个关系。From emerging powers to expanding partnerships, from fighting poverty to combating climate change, booming economies, war-ravaged nations, and everything in between, we capture the changes affecting the most dynamic and diverse continent on the planet, taking you beyond the headlines to the people and their stories. Asia Today, delivering Asia to the world. Let's apply the word comprehensive to each of the four comprehensives and understand the depth of meaning that we can get from it. So the first, being a moderately well-off society, has been China's goal for decades. Each of the previous generations have looked to this goal of, of achieving it. But now we have the word comprehensive, which, as you've said, uh, embeds a systematic approach. So, what is different today with achieving a moderately well-off society by calling it comprehensive? You, this question is very important, very good. Actually, this relates to our understanding of the future of the future. Actually, when we were very early, when we first came to China, we understood the future of the future as being the industrialization, which is the achievement of the social industrialization. But later, we further proposed 要实现四个现代化，就是农业、工业、国防、科学技术，这四个现代化。那么在这个过程中，我们也理解到呢，未来社会就是一个理想的社会，只有物质文明不行，所以我们要提出来要建设高度的精神文明。那么到了呃十七大的时候，我们就提出了一个比较完整的目标，叫做什么呢？叫做建设我们要建设的未来社会是什么呢？是富强、民主、文明、和谐的。社会主义现代化国家，这是我们对未来社会的，呃，一个比较理想或者比较呃概括的表述。那么就全面建成小康社会来说，这个全面也有几层含义。首先，它是涵盖的人群要全。我们知道中国啊，十三亿人，它很不平均。我们现在有一部分人很富裕，但是我们现在也有一部分人非常贫穷。按照我们中国的扶贫标准，就是年收入在两千三百元以下的，就算贫困人口的话，我们国家还有七千万贫困人口。如果按照联合国，呃，每人每天两美元以下就算贫困人口的话，我们还有两亿啊，就是这个贫困人口。那么你要实现全面建设小建成小康，如果不包括这部分人，那显然不是全面的。所以首先是个这个呃覆盖的人群要全面。再一个就是地域，中国的特点是这个地域分布不太均匀，东部地区发展的比较好，相对来说西部地区呢，呃比较落后，比较贫穷。那么要全面建成小康社会，你总不能说东部和西部差别那么大，你叫建成了小康，那不叫建成小康，这个地域问题。
during the third plenary session of the 18th Central Committee of the Communist Party. President Xi announced that China will comprehensively continue reform. To ensure the systematic implementation of reform, a leading group was set up in December 2013. Led by President Xi, the team also includes deputy group leaders Li Keqiang, Liu Yunshan, and Zhang Gaoli, all members of the Standing Committee of the Political Bureau of the CPC Central Committee. The leading group has held 11 meetings to date. The results of these meetings have touched every aspect of life of all Chinese. Deepening reform is something that has been the most important thing in China since Deng Xiaoping instituted it in the late 1970s, and so it's been in existence for more than 35 years. Now we have deepening reform in a comprehensive way. And so if I look at that, that means to me that reform has taken place in uneven uh, ways, so that some areas have been very reformed, other areas not so reformed. So does this indicate that, that the easy reforms have been done and now we're dealing with the harder reforms and maybe there are some obstacles or interest groups that are stopping reform and so reform needs to be done comprehensively is a nice way of saying there are obstacles and there are may, maybe groups that are opposing reform, and so now we have to make extra energy to be sure the reform is comprehensive. Actually,首先你比如说我们本来我们的目标是要营造一个公平竞争的这么一个环境以利于社会进一步的释放活力但是现在影响公平竞争的因素还很多所以我们这是我们一个重点的领域就是要营造一个公平竞争的环境是市场在这个资
in some countries change if you call about, if you embrace reforms you will lose elections you know fortunately in china we are still able to talk about reform discuss reforms and carry out reforms i even say not jokingly seriously what she did in terms of reform over the past two years is perhaps 20 times more than what Obama did in the past six years, yeah. indeed. Uh, 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 so, so reform is crucial, change for the better. China has a very similar example. It says, the water of the river cannot be in the same tree for two nights. Why? If you sleep here, you can sleep here. If you sleep here, you have a feeling of relief. You don't want to go. This shows that human being has a relationship with humanity. 有惰性，那么现在呢？我们有些体制机制实行了很多年了，人们有些习惯，习惯思维，成为一种思维定式，他不愿意改，这就是思想不够解放的问题。这是一种改革的阻力也不小啊，人们的这种惯性思维啊。那么还有一种，就是利益问题。我们的改革到了深水区以后，现在要改，进一步推进改革。必然涉及到利益的调整，要动利益了，要动他的奶酪了。那么有些人他就开始紧张。We hear about interest groups that are opposing various reforms in China, particularly rule of law. But who are these interest groups? It's always very general in the talk. I mean, who are they? 呃，既得利益集团在中国。呃，也不是一个特别敏感的话题，呃，但是呢，确实是需要研究的。我个人认为，呃，从既得利益的角度去说，至少有这么几个部分，呃，确确实实有可能产生呃这种既得利益集团。啊，一个呢，就是过去长期在缺乏法律约束的情况下，越过法律边界。而获得利益的这样一些人，啊，那么现在回过头来，如果用法律去规范，他可能会觉得不自在，他可能会觉得我要受到约束了，我会想方设法的要做一些对抗，这是一部分。第二部分呢，就是我们过去国有企业，国有企业应该是很很好的，是国家的支柱啊。但是由于它的运作方式过多的和行政权力混合在一起，没有分清楚。那在这中间呢，就是有权利，但是不受约束，结果很多时候就越过边界，公司不分，形成了一些特殊的利益啊，这是一块。还有一块呢，就是我们过去权利，我我跟你我跟您说过。它是合在一起的，合在一起的情况下，权力是不受约束的。那我们可以说，这是一种权力格局。那这种格局可以叫做是不合理的权力格局。但是不合理的权力格局背后是不合理的利益格局，权力背后全都有利益。那么在这样一种不合理的权力格局的情况下，沉淀下来的不合理的利益，同样。也容易形成既得利益，哎，你比如说有些部门，他掌手里掌握着很大的审批权，但是他可以不负责任，那他肯定不愿意交出这个审判审审批权，所以你也知道，这些年来我们不断的减少政府的审批事项，但是实事求是的说，有的是真减少了，有的也是部门说为了应付你一下，我把比较次要的交出去。还有很重要的权利，依然舍不得丢掉，这实际上也是一种既得利益，啊，所以在我看来，至少有这么三个方面，它是有既得利益形成的可能性的
President Xi Jinping has made rule of law the core of his domestic reform agenda. How do you define rule of law in general? And then how do you define socialist rule of law for its applicability in China? And are there Chinese characteristics to rule of law? We Nazi政治经济应该说只有一条，就是建立法治。所以依法治国可以说是我们今天推进改革、推进社会主义市场经济到今天的一个必然。那么依法治国当然在各国的情况不一样，在我们国家也有和西方相似的地方，就是法律之
关进制度的笼子里面。所以，把权力关进制度的笼子，不是我们中国人的发明，这是西方人，呃呃，很早就有这个说法。是啊，这个权力啊，绝对的权力就会产生绝对的腐败，权力一定要受到监督，一定要受到制约，不然它一定会产生腐败。我们现在对这个问题的认识是非常清楚的，所以下一步的重点。是健全体制机度、机制，加强党的纪律建设，加强国家的法律和制度方面的建设，使这个腐败分子他没有空子可钻，他这个权利受到限制、受到监督，他不能腐了，想腐都腐不了。这是第二，第三个就是不想腐，最根本的还是这个人呐、啊，让他不去想腐败，这就是根本上的问题了。那么怎么才能不降服啊？嗯，人的西方人说人的本性是恶，我们不是这个意思。但人的人是有欲望的，关键是要控制这个人的欲望。那我们共产党强调习习主席先生强调，首先是说要进行思想教育，要让人们有信念、有信仰。当然了，我们这个党。呃，他由于是战争时期过来的，是一个革命党转型过来的，因此呢，他强调高度的集中、高度的纪律。又因由于我们接收的更多的是苏联人的那种高度集权的政党模式，因此呢，党内民主一直发展不好，这个确实是个事实。但是，过去如果说党内民主发展不好，最后导致的只是我们的决策失误。像出现了文化大革命这样的事情，如果说那时候的只是这样一个结果的话，那现在如果不发展党内民主，可能影响到党的执政地位，它已经到了这样一个程度。To understand President Xi Jinping's political philosophy is to gain insight into where China is heading. We start with Xi's book, The Governance of China, and see in it the central role of improving the lives of the people. Deepening reform, rule of law, and strengthening the party; these then become codified in Xi's four comprehensives: comprehensively build a moderately prosperous society, comprehensively deepen reform, comprehensively govern the nation according to law, and comprehensively strictly govern the party. To achieve any of the four comprehensives is challenging. All of them, even more so, but here we're after something more. We're witnessing the crystallization, augmentation, and maturation of Xi's political thinking, and still we may not be close to its final form. Each of the four comprehensives has its own character. A moderately well-off society is a goal. Deepening reform is a means. Rule of law is a principle. Strict discipline of the party is a state of action. Where then is the unity? While each has been a major policy in itself, what sets the four comprehensives apart are two things: combining the four into a single idea and the word "comprehensive" as a descriptor. Linking them makes the point that these four are fundamental, and that if achieved, all else in China will follow. Comprehensive signals a profound, very public commitment to make each really happen, and there is now no turning back. We follow President Xi's political thinking to keep us closer to China.